Japanese drinks. Ooh. Uh, what what Japanese, kind of Japanese uh, drinks are we talking about? I don't know if it's Japanese, but I went to a Japanese market and I got, uh, it's called like Hikari Sweat. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's a big, that's one. actually really good. They have, I really like that. They and have, Go Curry is another one. It was like ooh. a grapefruit thing. I know which one you're talking about. Have you been to Japan ever? No. It's crazy, man. When you no. go, they have, uh, it's like vending machines everywhere. <laughs> yeah, vending all machines everywhere. Crazy sodas and all these crazy, like the, I've only been there once, but when I went there, it was like me and Wookiee and a few other people. And we, every time we passed one of the vending machines, that was the deal it was like, we had to get a different weird. It's like hot vending machines too, aren't there? Like yeah. You get like a soup and a thing. Oh man. I mean, it gets really weird. I, I got like. I got, it looked like a soda, but you open, you like pop the top and it was just corn inside, like just like cold corn. (laughs) Is this a can of corn? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not making this up. Like, uh, yeah, it was bizarre. Like, but kind of like a corn drink, like you were supposed to drink it. I don't know. This is not how I thought this was going to start, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm interested by all the vending machine things you can get in Japan. Are you like a, you went to the Japanese market. Are you, are you an appreciator of Japanese culture? Are you an anime guy? I don't watch that much anime. I, I think I was going to start watching uh, uh, Evangelion, I think it's called. Oh, yeah. That's the, like the mech one. Yeah. It's like, what is it? Where is it from? The uh, 80s or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Neon 90s? Genesis uh, Evangelion. I don't know if it was 80s or 90s, but it's one of those two for sure. And it's it's a right. classic. And I think it's in like 4-3 also. So it's like a, almost the square. Right. I really like stuff that's like that. Interesting. So, okay. How do you, okay. So you were like, you were messing with your OBS settings, changing the camera. Now you're talking about like aspect ratio do you have like a visual art background do you no. are you interested in film any of that kind i like of film i like uh watching film and like studying film but just in like a not like an actual film school environment just like watching a lot of films and just kind of paying attention to things and seeing how certain things were done certain things were made so I just really like film. Do you think that interest has any bearing on your music? Because I know I, I've like I've read a few interviews of yours when I knew we were coming to talk, and you talk a lot about how you, the artwork in your music has, holds a lot of meaning for you. Do you think that yeah. you feel like the visual is, is really tied to the music for you? I think it is. I think if you have good visuals along with the music, that kind of means something to the music, then uh, it's just something more you can do as far as the, the experience goes than just like making a song out and having random artwork. Right, right, right. So I think if you tie the two together, uh, you can do more with it than just a song and some sort of like, I don't, know. I don't know an example of like a generic artwork, but something that's like not, where people don't really care that much (laughs) yeah well yeah i mean i think that that's the key right like i think with all of your music i can tell that you care a lot about the details of it and and i think that's one of the things that attracted me to your music in the first place was that you could really tell that you were thinking about a lot and that it really meant that you were invested in it you know like all right thank you at any level yeah absolutely man i mean i i don't know if like, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but have have you always thought that way? Like, you're still a relatively young musician and producer. What was it like for you when you were very first making music? Like, were you thinking in terms of like these sort of more philosophical concepts we're talking about right now? Probably not. I mean, when I started, started making music, I was like 13, I think. And at that point, I was just like, my kind of mindset was like, I want to be like hardwell and playing all these shows and like jumping up on stage with fire coming out, like from the back of me and that kind of thing. And then the more I started working on music, the more I was like, I really don't want to do that. I don't want to like 
uh, that's not the kind of music I want to make or the kind of like <laughs> aesthetic I want to have. I don't want to be like a like festival DJ or anything like that. Nothing against people who do festival DJ stuff. It's just, I kind of like more the vibe of music where it's like, it's something you would like listen to in the car or at home, but isn't necessarily like you can hear it being played live. I guess there's always a point when I might have to play it live, but uh, I kind of make music more for like a, I guess a personal experience rather than like a, uh, yeah, the, the headphones like social versus experience. the club, right? Yeah. The, like a, an individual experience or more small experience versus being in a group of like a thousand people listening to some giant thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Cause you said in there like, well, eventually maybe I I'll have to play it live at some <laughs> point. Right. Which I, it makes me wonder, and I, I think someone in the chat was saying too, like, what is what is your relationship to to doing it live, to touring, and all that? Because I, I think you get lumped together with EDM guys and EDM girls a lot, right? Well, I think I, pr- I think I don't know. I would say I make EDM. I guess I don't know. Yeah, I don't really know what the, how you define it. I mean, sometimes it might be hard to dance to but it's electronic um <laughs> like you can't dance to all of my songs i think there's parts in some where it's just like a bunch of foley happening you can't really like <laughs> piss bump to yeah. that but i mean you can um, try but <laughs> you can try but i don't know if it would work i mean it's kind of inevitable that you have to play it live usually um, well, I mean, do you enjoy doing that? Like I, you, you've toured, uh, you've played shows. Like is, is that kind of experience not, I, yeah, and I'm not talking about the standing on the tables, cryo pumping kind of stuff, but just in general, like, do you like being on stage in front of people? I like the general setting of being like doing a show and being with people that you like. Cause I did a tour with, um, well, before COVID, and then it got shut down. We only did half of it. Yeah. I did a tour with uh, Drew Lou, and Tasca Black was there. And that was all a really fun experience. Um, when it comes to doing the actual show, I haven't yet found a way that I enjoy it that much as far as actually performing. Yeah. Because um, I still want to do more as far as like, I feel like it could be more of a unique experience if I had the right setup. Um, but having the right setup would be a lot of money. I'd probably have to do my own tour, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, are, would you be, are you thinking about what that would look like? Some kind of like, you know, fully, like a very live tour? More organic than, like organic as far as like, when there's lasers at a show or that kind of thing. Right. Trying to make those look less electronic than they normally are or just certain environmental things. Like I don't, this would, they probably wouldn't let you do this at a venue, but just stupid things like putting dirt on the floor of the stage. (laughs) You'd be surprised what they'd let you do. Or like plants all around you, those kind of things. Uh, And just having the experience more, I don't know, more like feeling like you're in some sort of weird nature place. Maybe. Yeah, I, um, I, I love that, man. You could absolutely do that. I think people have flirted with ideas like that in the past, but it's really, like you said earlier, I mean, it's really, if you have the money to do it, the venues, they don't care. They'll let yeah, you do yeah. It. But the money what, to do it is a different matter. The money to do it is a different thing, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think all of the shows I've done, uh, not all of them, but, uh, most of the shows I've done are supporting like roles for a bigger artist. Um, so it's usually you have to work within what they're doing and you don't, you can't really tear down what they're doing and set up your own thing just for that. And then you have to reset the stage for them. Yeah. You'll just have to work within what they have set up. So, um, yeah, it's, can be, I guess, kind of difficult because I want to be thoughtful with every aspect of music I do. Um, 
And sometimes it can feel like there's a disconnect with the show side of it and the music side of it. Like I would want to do something that feels unique and uh, connected to the music live, but with supporting acts or smaller budget, you can't always do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's true, man. It's, it's, I, it's, it's interesting you say that. I'm glad we're talking about this because I think this is an issue a lot of artists early on in their career really encounter is that you can have all the 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 best ideas in the world you can have a clear vision you just don't have any money (laughs) (laughs) exactly man (laughs) yeah i don't know it's it's tough i mean some people like people do it different ways some people just wait and hold back until it gets to a certain point some people try to sort of execute it on a on a smaller like diy level And then some people just say, you know, fuck it and kind of just jump into kind of the the machine of it, you know, whether that's opening for a bunch of other people's tours for yeah, a few yeah. years, all of it. I don't know. There's there's no right or wrong way, but I, I always like seeing where people's heads are at like early on like this. I mean, I don't think there's any sort of like, obviously, I'm not, I don't have the money or the like pool as far as people goes to just jump right into and do giant shows with like a perfect aesthetic um but yeah it is something it's like um every other aspect i want to be thoughtful about kind of having a cohesive look for things and vibe for things and i think it's just a general problem with maybe electronic music is when you go on stage at a venue it's like all right we're doing standard lighting setup and it's going to look like some techno rave thing always. Right. And there's never really like, a, like, it's not like, like when you go to a play, you know, there's going to be a certain look to it. And just imagine if every like electronic music act had a unique look where you go there and you're like, this does not look like the last one I was just at. Right. This is like some steampunk looking show <laughs> or something. <laughs> or you go to another one. It's like, I don't know, more organic, maybe looking or different things. Um, I don't know. I just want to see more unique setups visually. I would love that, man. I think the main thing is just the, the lasers that come down. There's no matter what the setup is, there's always the lasers that come down and the lasers <laughs> always look the same. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, is there any way we can make lasers look different or I, do something different lighting wise? Uh, yeah. I have a similar complaint about like cryo cannons and led walls too. Where yeah, yeah. We, individually they're all fine, but I'm just like, I don't know, man, especially for the larger artists who really do have a choice and a say in this. Mm-hmm. It's funny. I talk yeah. on this show. I talk a lot about how I think a lot of times it, people just sort of follow what everyone else is doing in in our scene, even on a big level, like even some of the, the bigger names, because it's what works. And because yeah. at a certain point, the money gets so high that everyone's like, well, look, this is the safe bet. If we don't want to mess things up. Yeah, we yeah. don't want to screw with it. The The venue already has the LED wall. We can just show up. It'll be fine. You know, that kind of thing. It's easier. Right. It simplifies our life, all of that. But the, the net result of that, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, and I'm not calling anyone out specifically, but it's, it's complacency, right? And that to me, complacency is like the killer of creativity and the killer of innovation and, and all I think it's just a lot of people think when they're doing a show, it's like, you want to do something that's big and feels like a, it's like, I guess it's similar to how there's usually always strings used in a score for a movie. Right. It's like, we know this works and it feels epic. So we're going to do it again. (laughs) Um, Versus things that are like entirely like synth based scores, which are usually a bit weirder. Um, I think it's just, these are the kind of things that people think of when they think of like a big epic live set or show going to a, a big show with like the lasers and all that. But something I really like, and I think this might've had lasers at it. I'm not sure, but, um, I think there was like two giant people in like bear costumes dancing on stage. Okay. And this was an old Apex twin show, I think in like the late nineties or maybe early two thousands. And he was just laying down on stage 
with like this synth where he was doing random things oh, and he was yeah. just laying down. <laughs> he was like, he looked like he was going to fall asleep possibly, but he was just sitting there doing this thing and people were watching. And I'm like, imagine if you went to a show now and the guy was just laying down <laughs> on stage. You're like, what's going on? But I feel like it's, I don't know. It's definitely something you would talk about if you saw that. Oh, absolutely. Like, I mean, there was a Dead Mouse used to do, you know, you want to talk about like the biggest of the big EDM, like yeah, yeah. big top shit. Dead Mouse, there was a part of his show. I don't know if he still does it, but there was a part of his show where like he put a couch out in front of oh, his big couch, cube right. and for like, he would just play a song and I, and you know, he down. was kind of like dismantling the idea of like, oh, we just push buttons. Nothing's actually yeah. happening live. And he would just play a song. And for the whole song, he would just sit on the couch and like drink a beer. And right. to me, I was like, man, that's whether or not the people in the audience enjoyed it. I was like, <laughs> it's, it's fun. It's innovative yeah. and it's fun. And we're talking about it however many years yeah. later. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like, I feel like shows are kind of connected to it's kind of become like, I guess it's the argument versus whether a show is, whether you're going there to watch someone perform something at a really high skill level, like doing instruments and uh, think where you could actually mess up with something. Um, like you're, you have to play a guitar, or you have to play a piano or something. Um, or if you're going there to see just an experience or a show. Right. Uh, I think both are, are cool. And it's definitely cool to see people play live instruments. And I'd say I probably just sonically, I like going to live instrument bands live more than like electronic music. Right. Um, but if you're doing like an electronic show, you usually don't have to do that much. Like you can do a lot, but you can get away with not doing that much yeah, where you, you're kind of you bored for to, a lot right? of it. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to. So what you could do, if you're not doing a lot in that area, you could kind of run your show like, like a play where there's certain events that happen in it that are scripted and gives a really strange experience to the audience that they're like, I haven't seen anything like that in a while. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it basically for me, I don't really care what I'm going to see as long as I feel like the person is invested in it, as long as yeah, I yeah. can see their personality in it. Right, like I, right. I just want to I want to connect with them. And to me, it's much more boring to just, it, we've all been to shows where you can kind of just tell that they're just doing the, the same thing, you know, like they're kind of just, yeah. they're on the track. I won't go as far as to say phoning it in, but you know, <laughs> like sometimes you go to a festival and it's like, well, I couldn't even really tell half the people on stage, you know, like it all kind of looked the right, same. It right. all kind of sounded the same. And these might even be artists that I like and people that I like, you know, right. but it's, yeah, there, there's this sort of, yeah, like just sameness in it. And I think you kind of from the jump were in, like, I want to bring this back to you and talking about what you do oh. is, is <laughs> I think you've been uh, against that from early on. And I think it's interesting to talk about, like we were talking a second about when you started making music mm -hmm. and like, how quickly did you start thinking about this stuff? Like, at, oh, like, right. I never really answered that. Well, yeah, yeah. But let, I can maybe even ask it in a better way, which is that I'm curious when you started making music, you know, how quickly did you realize that, you know, what I'm doing is sort of different or maybe I'm thinking about this differently? Because I think when you just start and you don't know anything yet, it's so easy to feel pressure to that, oh, I should do this to fit in or, oh, this successful person is doing this. If I sort of copy that formula, maybe that's right. a good way to start, you know, all of that. But I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like you did not do that so much. What do you mean? Like trying uh, to make things that I think would do well? Well, <laughs> to play into a. I, I mean, I think we, I think we <laughs> well, all. Actually, that makes things. the sound. That makes no, the no, sound no. But no, I. I guess all I'm saying is but to me, not just music, doing something because it's currently doing well. Yeah, and not necessarily trying to fit into a scene right away. Is I guess right, what okay. I'm saying. I don't know. I mean, I've really liked. 
like when I well when I started out start out I really liked listening to uh, like Zed Zed was the main Zed and Dead Mouse and like the what is it Money Sucks Friends Rule Dylan Francis album yeah sure all that kind of music is what I really liked early on um, like super EDM stuff like super EDM stuff. Um, How did you hear that stuff in the first place? I don't know. Um, I think I downloaded some sort of like iPad, like music making app. <laughs> yeah. And then I started making music and it was really bad. But then I'm like, this is kind of cool sounding though. I think I got recommended like a, a, or it was on Facebook or something. I saw like a, the Maddion launchpad videos. I was like, this is kind of crazy looking. Cause I was just like, I wasn't that into music, but I'm like, it looks like something that's just fun to do. It looks almost like a game or something. Right. So I asked for a launch pad for Christmas and I was like, I just want this launch pad cause I want to press buttons and make a song out of it. Uh, and then I got it and I didn't know it. It came with Ableton. I'm like, well, how do I do what they're doing in this thing? Mm. Like, how do I, make it so when I play something, it plays the song. I didn't know at all how to use Ableton. And eventually it just became like, I've never used Launchpad for that purpose. <laughs> of course. For like doing those things. Of course. Because after that, I was like, well, now I have to figure out how to use Ableton in order to do that thing. Um, how old were you? I think I was like, probably like 13, I would say. Man. So 13, young, maybe, man, yeah. maybe 13 going on 14. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I was trying to figure out how to use Ableton. And then I moved to FL because I'm like, I think it was like someone I knew knew how to use FL. So like, I can teach you how to use FL, but I don't know how to use Ableton. So I'm like, all right, I'll learn FL then. Um, so I started using FL. And yeah, I think I just was working on like progressive house stuff at the time. So I was like, I want to listen to more stuff that's like this so I can kind of like figure out how to make it or get inspiration. Right. Um, but then I think it was like, I don't know when it was, but I got, I got a game called um, Sleeping Dogs. Okay. And I was like maybe 14 or 15 or something. It's like a, it's a game that takes place in China and you're like, you can do like martial arts moves and you have to fight like a, like, a, like a crime syndicate or something. And you're an undercover cop. Sure. But in that game, uh, there was, uh, after like by rusty. Oh, wow. That, that song. And I was like, what is this? This is crazy sound. <laughs> like, this is the craziest sign thing ever. I'm like, and this isn't like progressive house. This isn't like the beats always right. like four or four on the floor. I'm like, you can do so much more with music. And also like the way it's in that song, it's almost like just like a brass hit, like a standard trap brass hit. And you can almost hear it like cutting off and you can hear it's like a one shot almost. I'm like, it's like something about just the weird, like using samples in a way that sounds kind of, bad but interesting at the same time uh i was like i wanted to i want to mess around more with like just i don't know making random beats that aren't always the same because mm. at that time i was like always just doing progressive house which is always four four on the floor um right. i'm like i just it's, it's getting <laughs> it's kind of getting boring but i still wasn't quite ready to let it go it was kind of a tough just mentally it was tough to stop making that i'm like i i, I like progressive house still but i kind of knew in my head like i can't keep making this forever like i can't just keep doing the same thing over and over again but like that's so that's I, crazy to know at age 14 like that's that was that might have been when i was like Going on 15, kind of. Uh, I mean, it's still crazy at 15, man. <laughs> like, <it's> like, <laughs> uh, uh, well, I, I, I'm just interested because you said you weren't even that into music earlier on in your life. No. 
And no. did you have any musical background? Like, did you play instruments? Anything like no. that? No, I, there was this, when I was really young, probably like five or something, I was at this like, uh, out preschool or something, or I don't know what it was. And <laughs> they were handing out all these instruments. I'm like, oh, all these cool instruments. And then I ended up getting the triangle. <laughs> they gave me the triangle. I'm like, damn it. What am I going to do with this? So just hit it. Right. I'm like, I, and I don't know why, but I really want the symbols. Oh, like sure. they look cool. Yeah. They look super um, cool. They're loud. Yeah. They're loud. They look cool. You just hit them together. <laughs> um, but yeah, I got the triangle and that was probably the only music experience I had. Yeah. So early you, on. I like the idea that to you, music was just the triangle and you're like, Oh, music sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all, all music is just yeah. hitting this triangle. Over and over again. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I'm trying to think, no, I didn't have any music background. Uh, so then it must, I kinda, am I right? Am I oh, right? Not, no, not to cut you off, but I just want to see if my theory is right. That like, once you jumped in then age 13, 14, 15, got it, you yeah. know, like started absorbing all this music quickly started making it yourself. Like, was it just like this information dump? Did you go like super deep, super quickly? I can't, I can't quite remember. I know like when I started out, it wasn't really like, I didn't think of it as music really. I was like, it's a fun, like, it's fun to just go in here and mess around and make random things. Cause it almost felt like a game. Were you a gamer? Um, yeah. I played a lot of games. Yeah. Like I, I was playing sleeping dogs, that kind of stuff. Right. Um, and then, I mean, obviously like for my age, I was playing Minecraft and those kind of things. And then like some Skyrim like that stuff. Yeah. Uh, and Oblivion. But yeah, so I played a lot of games. And I was also like, well, games are fun, but when you're working on music, it's like you're working towards something. Like you'll improve while you work on something. But it's not just like once you stop making music for the day, it's like, it's like when, it, when you're doing a game and you are playing a game, then you like turn off the game. You're like, well, did I really gain anything from that? Yeah, what do like, I have what, to show for this? Yeah, whereas when you're doing music, you'll be working on it for like the whole day. And then after that, you'll have, say, the song you made, but also you'll have the knowledge that you accumulate over the day. So it was kind of nice knowing that it was something I was working towards. And I was getting better at it. Right. And then eventually just was like, I want to become really good at it. And I want to, like, I don't want to stop learning at it. I just want to keep going and keep learning stuff. And I don't know if I watched that many tutorials. I think I was just kind of, I mean, I think the way I would do it early on, and even now I still do it, is if there's something I liked and wanted to do, I would just listen to somebody that had done it and then really carefully listen to it and try to uh, like reverse engineer what was done in the song right. by just what I could tell it was. I think that's like one of the best ways to teach yourself production is to listen yeah, to something you really like and try, like really take the time. Try to make it. Try to yeah. make it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, at that time it was like Rusty, uh, Flume, uh, who else? I guess, oh, Fly Low, like Flying Lotus. Um, and then later on was probably like Radiohead and Tom York stuff. Yeah. Uh, and why am I blanking on artists? <laughs> uh, oh, Ash Kusha. Oh, yeah, There's sure. one that was really cool. And then Arca. I remember this might be going off on a tangent, but. Oh, let's go. Uh, someone I know was like, have you checked out the granulizer in FL? I'm like, no, I haven't checked it out. They're like, well, I, re I just read the whole FL manual and it's, <laughs> it was talking about the granulizer that's in FL. I'm like, okay. And they're like, you should try putting samples in it and make like pads with it. It's crazy sound. I'm like, oh, I'll try it out. Uh, cause they were, all, they were a huge fan of Arca and they're like, right. you should also listen to Arca. Um, 
So I started just putting stuff in granulizers. I'm like, no, I feel like you don't really even have to be that great at producing to do cool stuff with a granulizer. Like you can just throw something in and make like a pad right. or like a one shot you can throw and make a pad out of it or a vocal you can make a pad out of it or like keys out of it. Uh, or a drum loop, you can make some weird drum loop out of it. Um, so I started doing that, and I feel like any time I can kind of take some of the stress of production off of me and just put it into like some sort of thing where it kind of randomizes, and then I have to figure out what to do with it after, is when I like making music. Mm. So I was getting stuff out of granulizers that was like, can I really do something with this? I don't know, but I'll try and I'll see, I'll see if I can do something. Um, so I feel like that's what I like the most. Not like eventually I realized I didn't like doing set the kind of sound design where you're like, you're aiming for a certain sound more like you just go in with no intentions and then you come out with something that you weren't really thinking of. Yeah, I, and I then think you that's go in a, that direction. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's a great exercise for creativity in general. I mean, I think anybody, any great songwriter in any genre will tell you that you know it's you you want to put yourself in that sort of like open place, and you're, right, you're, yeah. you're trying usually like whatever comes to you first, like that's going to be the idea, right? right? Yeah, yeah, and you kind of just have to. It, it's all. It's such a weird idea because it's if you think about it too much, you're doing it wrong. But <laughs> but but yeah. the idea being basically to yeah you know like open yourself up creatively and then just be able to make these really quick decisions. Yeah, you know, yeah. go down these rabbit holes while still kind of like maintaining control over the whole product like it's it's harder to talk about than it is to just to just do it you to know? do it yeah 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 i never really went too crazy as far as like synthesis sound design goes like working in a synth to make a crazy sound because that just took really long yeah and i feel like i probably have adhd or something but i was like i can't i can't sit through this this is it's taking too long to do something <laughs> i want to do um, so yeah, I, I would, I kind of went to granulizers and just like sampling stuff and making weird, like placing drums off grid when I'm like, I don't, I don't have time to place on grid. I'm just going to place it wherever and see if it works. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of strayed away from doing the like intentional sound design eventually because I feel like the less I try to control it, the more I do cool stuff. And the more I try to search for a certain thing, the more I'm not open to doing something that may be different than what I want. Yeah, I think that's great, man. I think, I mean, it makes me think about just the idea of collaboration in general. I mean, that's, you know, that's like one of the best benefits of working with other people on, on right. any kind of art is that, you yeah, know, yeah. they'll make choices you didn't expect. You'll build something together you couldn't have built by yourself. But I like the idea that it's sort of just you and <laughs> it's collaborating like, with yourself kind of. Kinda, yeah. yeah. Or like the, the, the computer or the universe or, or like whatever, you know, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of interesting. I also really like collabs too, though, because if it's, someone whose music you are really interested by and you're working on something with them where it's like, you don't quite know what they're going to do. Um, that's really interesting to me because every time I collab with somebody, I want it to kind of be like, I usually either work on something they've set, then they work on it again, or I come up with something uh, and they work on it. But I like seeing how they change what I've done on it to be different. Because right. I used to do, there's certain things I'll probably subconsciously do in music that other people probably don't do. Uh, and I don't know, like, even just rhythmically, I think it's cool to analyze like how people are doing things. Um, I really liked the uh, the collab you did with uh, Caption. 
Um, oh yeah. Yeah. I, I was just listening Thank back you. to that earlier today and yeah, I, I really like that one, man. Cause it, it didn't, again, it didn't sound exactly like either of you. And, right. uh, and, and yeah, it was just, it was refreshing. And th- this is kind of me going off on a tangent for a second, but just because the, we're talking about this song right now, like I was listening to that song, which for everybody in the chat, everybody listening later, uh, maybe we'll even listen to it later on, uh, once we're done talking here, but you got to check it out. It's an amazing suit. Is it uh, Acai Tower? It's Acai Tower. It's like yeah. the, just the bear. That's what I, that's <laughs> what I thought. Tree. I was just making yeah. sure. <laughs> And so to me, that sound is like there, it's sort of indebted to like the SoundCloud era. Like I heard that yeah, song yeah. and it made me think about the SoundCloud era where right. there were all these ideas flying around, all this like innovation and progression happening really fast, but kind of in a like a DIY way. Yeah, like it not- felt. Like a community the mixing was way. a little bit off, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and the there music was small like, things like that. Yeah, like the music wasn't always perfectly polished, right? And, yeah. and all that. Do you do you feel that? Do you feel like what you do is in any way indebted to the SoundCloud era? Is that kind of how you came up? Yeah, I mean, I was most of the people I currently know I've met just from SoundCloud. Like early on, I was on SoundCloud a bunch, and I would just. Um, there's someone I've worked with quite a bit named Tech Genesis. And the way I met him was I commented on a track he did with someone named Nocto ages ago. And it was just like, this is a sick track. Uh, I forgot what I said. I, I don't even know what I said. I think I just said like sick track or something. But uh, somehow it ended up that they were like, do you want to, do you want to like work on a song? I think we joined like a, like a group chat or something. We were talking. They were just like two guys from Australia. And I met a bunch of people from Australia. Um, and we just kept talking. And then there's still people that I'll find on SoundCloud that are, are really interesting and cool. That you don't always find that kind of stuff on like Spotify. Yeah. Spotify is usually stuff that's like usually bigger artists not always but usually bigger artists that you get recommended not a community right like soundcloud no there's well yeah there's no comments yeah there's no comments that's why i always like soundcloud um because yeah you could comment and then somebody could say something it's like i think it's a good ratio of uh kind of being a place where people can listen to music but also being like a place where you could comment something, someone could reply and then a discussion could start below it where it's just more like a community experience. Um, and I feel like that's, what's missing from most current streaming services. There's no, like you'll have stuff that sounds similar and you'll be recommended similar stuff, but it's not a community really. Right. And I think, you know, to take it even one level deeper, it's it's changing the sounds that people are making. Right. Like, I think if we're talking about the SoundCloud era, whether it's the trap scene or the beat scene or what, you know, all these little mini scenes that were happening on SoundCloud. Yeah, yeah. I think so many of those artists have either had a hard time or just had a like switched up what they were doing with the rise of Spotify and other streaming platforms because uh, there's like certain types of music that do better on those platforms which to me that's like a just a scary thought that people would actually be you know making their creative decisions based on the platforms available yeah i know yeah i mean that's kind of the thing of like making a song that's like like close to two minutes so then on spotify like spotify is kind of made so people make really short songs now because if you play it over and over again you get more plays and that's right. more money <laughs> um so yeah i feel like music's getting shorter and shorter uh <laughs> and that, that might also be because of people's attention spans but Um, Well, right. But it's like, then it's like, well, why are our attention spans getting shorter? Is it because everything we're showing is now 10 second clips? Like, (laughs) I don't know. 
and maybe I just am not too involved with this community, but I wonder there might still be a thriving kind of DIY music community on like TikTok or something. I don't really know. I don't go on TikTok yeah. ever. Um, I mean, definitely some people have been able to use TikTok to break out like unknown artists in a way yeah. that they probably wouldn't have been able to on other platforms. Like there's definitely still people innovating, but I, I do always just wonder where it goes, you know? And then like yeah. what happens to the people who built uh, their name on a certain platform when that platform is no longer like the, it goes away, the yeah. hot thing. Well, and let me ask you to, to turn it back to you for a second. Like at any point in your career thus far, have you felt the kind of pressure we're talking about to either change what you're doing or to fit into a certain thing. I mean, A, have you ever felt it? And and B, have you ever acted on it in any way? No, I don't think so. I mean, maybe early, early on before I started doing like theater stuff, before I started, like when I was still making Progressive House, I was kind of in that mindset. Um, but music's kind of hard to work on. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of hard to make music sometimes. <laughs> so I kind of had to adapt. And I was like, I can't, if my goal is to make something that's successful and I'm just waiting on success, not trying to make something I think is cool in the moment, then I'll always be chasing something that is not, not now it's in the future. Yeah. Um, so I'm like, I have to enjoy what I make now if I want to keep making music. I can't just like, because I was like, oh, I want to do shows where I'm like sad or hard while fires coming out behind me, like I said. But um, I feel like the people who are still in that mindset eventually fall out of music. Because it, once it gets too hard, if you're just doing it for those reasons, not the enjoyment of making music. Yeah then you won't have enough drive to keep doing it because it's based on external factors, not the internal factor of making something that you're proud of or enjoy. Um, so I feel like just with how difficult music can be to make something that's good, um, it, that kind of forced my mindset to change to be kind of like, I'm going to make stuff I like and maybe people I know like, but not try to do something that I think is going to do well. I say that because, all the time, man. It's like if we're yeah. like the, the shit we do is hard enough. You know, if you just want to <laughs> do this to make money, like, well, let's all go be lawyers, you know, <laughs> yeah. not, not yeah. that's not hard. That's very hard to do. That's but, difficult too. Yeah, but, yeah. but you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. In this, There's probably other things you could do. Yeah. Well, sure. It's like if we're choosing this career of financial instability and, <laughs> you know, like crushing anxiety, you yeah. know, we might as well. Uh, have yeah, average while we're doing average it. wage of a musician is I think thirty five thousand a year. Yeah, which yeah. is not not good. Well, and I guarantee you, somebody is listening to this right now and be like, "Ooh, thirty! If I could just get to thirty five thousand, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think I make thirty five thousand." Um, but yeah, I feel like if you want to last in music, you have to make things for, I guess, just for like a community or for yourself. Because it kind of became like a thing where I was making something. I'm like, I would say to a friend, like, what do you think of this? Or like, do you like this? And it kind of just like we were just making stuff kind of to impress each other or ourselves sometimes. And that was fun because it's like we're, we're not releasing this right now, but we can see if the other person likes it. Yeah. And then we can see where it can go from there. When did it change? When did you start looking at it, uh, you know, not as not as a game, not as as just like a fun thing to do, but, you know, maybe something you could do as a career, maybe something you could have a name in? I mean, it's still a game until I have to mix the song. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's always kind of a game or something fun to do until it gets to like the technical side of it, which is like the mixing and mastering. Sure. Um, but when did you start looking at yourself as a musician, as somebody who's like part of this bigger community, you know? Oh, uh, musician. 
I don't Do I don't you know. look at yourself as a musician? <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't really know if I do. I, I make music. Um, but I don't know. I just like making things. And uh, my manager kind of figures out the releasing of stuff. But I still kind of just make things that I like making. No matter what that is, even right. if it's uh, who knows what I'll make, but uh, I just want to make things I think are cool, even if it's like a some small thing I do, like a craft I do or something, or some I don't know, some like physical craft that I make, or maybe I mean, this would be kind of a long process and a difficult process, but uh, making a film or something, yeah. Um, so I don't know. I kind of like, I make music, but I don't, I don't know if I'm necessarily a musician. I don't know. I make, I make sounds <laughs> right. on a computer. <laughs> people, some people like it. Um, <laughs> that's a, no, it's a good, good answer, man. I, I think again, you're not, it's kind of like what you were saying about creativity earlier. I, I think what you're doing is just not overthinking it, not overanalyzing it. And and really focusing on the fun of it, which uh, the longer any of us can do that, man, the the happier we're going to be at the end I think of the day. The, the more thoughtful part of it, as far as the art side of it goes, is thinking, especially with this the music that's coming up and like my album that I'm doing. Um, yeah, well, yeah, we'll talk about that for sure. <laughs> that is more thoughtful as far as the lore and how the aesthetics connect to the music side of it, uh, which is something I think about more than making the music. Because I don't know, I, I don't... People can kind of say that they meant to do something with music, but for the most part, you kind of just go in and you make something and you don't really know what you're going to make and you don't really know why you made it and you don't really know if it has a meaning. Mm. Um, can we talk about this for a second? I have, I have theories about this. Right. What are your theories? on? Well, so I, I've been talking to people recently, uh, about these kinds of ideas where I'm, I'm sort of a, I'm a skeptic and, a, and a, sometimes an asshole where, you know, if sometimes you hear people say, you know, Oh, I, I poured my soul into this song and, you know, I hope you all feel the deep feelings I was feeling when yeah. I wrote it, you know, that kind of thing. I, I'm skeptical of that a lot of the times, because like you said, I think creativity oftentimes is just sort of sitting down and seeing what happens and, yeah. and being in the moment and being open and receptive and everything we've been talking about. But what I've sort of realized over the last few weeks talking to other people about this is I think maybe what you make can kind of be like a mirror that you reflect yourself back to you with. If yeah, that makes autobiographical. Sense. Yeah, yeah. And, and maybe you can look at it or listen to it later on and be like, oh, I, I, I was angry or, oh, I was sad. You know, that kind of thing where yeah. you don't necessarily know it in the moment. Yeah, it's like if you took a video of yourself all day for a certain day and looked back at it like a year later, you're like, I was doing things that weren't intentional, but I could definitely see I'm in a certain mood. Right. Um, I think it's different with, uh, like lyric music that has lyrics. In it. When you write lyrics, I think there's a difference between that and electronic music because with that, you cut, you have to think more about what you're writing than just, uh, like making sounds and kind of letting, like the computer do some of it. Well, sure. Cause once um, language is involved, that like is a different part of our brain. Yeah. Right? You have to be more thoughtful with that. So when people say they poured their heart and soul into it, if it's with like lyric writing stuff, it's easier to believe because I can see that you would have to take time to make sure that's right. But with electronic music, I feel like a lot of people just do it and you just work on it and you're not really, you're not, really thinking about what you're doing. You're just kind of working on stuff. Well, um, I mean, let's talk about for you then. I mean, you have made electronic music with 
vocals and with lyrics, which, yeah. you know, is, is a bit of, of splitting the difference, I guess. I mean, even like the, the latest single you put out, uh, which is, if I'm correct, waiting for you. Right. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. E- even with that, I mean, it's, it's interesting to think about, first of all, when you work with a vocalist, how collaborative yeah. is that process? Are you involved with the lyric writing of it? It depends on the the song. With that one, I wasn't really involved with lyric writing that much because um, that was done by uh, by uh, someone named Wes Mills. He does uh, other, like beat stuff, but he also does lyric writing. Right. So that was him that wrote those lyrics, and then uh, Willow sang them. So I wasn't too involved with the, the writing on that one. Uh, and the lyrics were also done after the song was done. So that was kind of a different different experience than some other ones. There's another song I worked on uh, with someone named Fortune, where I wrote maybe half of the lyrics. But that was also kind of not something I thought about that much. Um, I think the meaning of it may be subconscious or just something I was thinking about at the time, but it wasn't like that one was actually pretty easy to write. Uh, that one hasn't come out, but, uh, that was just something I was in the shower. I'm like, I have this melody in my head. And then I was like, but what words could they say if they were singing this melody? I'm like, Oh, they could say this. And I wrote it down on like my phone. And then I went into FL and wrote the melody on piano. Uh, and then I was already working with this singer and we were trying to figure something out, but we couldn't really figure out what to do. I'm like, could you sing these lyrics in this melody over this beat? And the beat was like, it was like an acoustic drum loop and like a bass right. line. And that's not what the song is now. But I'm like, if you could sing this, we can see what we can do with that. And then he sang that. And then I kind of made the song around it. And then he wrote more lyrics for it after that. Uh, that were things he was thinking of, but still kind of continuing the, same, same the theme, lyrics. Yeah. It, it was the same, same path. So that was more, I was more involved with lyric writing on that. Oh, actually the next song I'm releasing on Friday, I think it is. By the way, Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th. Great day to, to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't I didn't order pants because I'm like, they're going to arrive on Friday the 13th. And I don't want pants that are on Friday the 13th. <laughs> no. I don't want to. Anytime I wear those. Bad those luck. pants aren't going to fit right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that. Um, no, but that one that's coming out is with uh, Pauline Her. She's and great. She wrote the lyrics for that. But the melody she's singing in the chorus is the same melody as the chord progression I wrote. Right. Um, so it was it was the chord progression that she kind of sang in, uh, and that beat I made I made the original beat under like a a grime acapella, like a UK grime acapella, as like just a beat. Right. But then I'm like, it's kind of melodic, so maybe I could make it into a different song or like continue it with a vocalist. Yeah. So that was that. And then there's another one. Uh, Which by the way, I, I have heard a lot of these. I got sent a folder of. Oh, you got sent the. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, is, is that whole uh, playlist? Like, is that all the album? Is it? I don't know how, how many much. Tracks? I don't want to spoil anything, but there were a lot of tracks. Yeah. It's, that might be that. Okay. Album. <laughs> uh, yeah. If it's about thirty songs, yeah, it was it was that's just a little album, over yeah. thirty, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a big swig right there. That's a big old album. Yeah, but there's another one I did with a singer named Theo, and that one, she I think, yeah, she wrote the lyrics and the melody for it too. Uh, but that was kind of more of a somewhat collaborative process as far as the songwriting went because when we first were talking about the song and and we're on like a zoom call yeah i was like let's do a let's do a tarot card reading and see what cards we get 
<laughs> and then based on those cards, we'll make a song around kind of the the message we got from the tarot cards. Oh, that's interesting. I kind of like that. Uh, that actually so reminds I, me of you throwing something in the granulizer and and seeing what comes out. Yeah, where it's it's kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was that. That song was kind of based around a tarot card and various things on uh, my album are thematically based around tarot card themes and uh, medieval stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, let's let's talk about it for a second, because I you mentioned earlier that this album, the upcoming album, uh, does it have a name? Is there any details we should share? It does have a name. I don't. We, I don't we know don't if I can to, say the name. Yeah, we don't. Have I to think I can it. say the name. I guess I could. I don't know. Now, it's we, called Dawn. Dawn. Okay, beautiful. Dawn. I guess I can say the name. I don't know. I mean, we said it now, so. <laughs> Who cares? Yeah. I don't know. Um, um, but what I was going to say is you were saying that, you know, in in making this album that you felt like it was maybe narratively cohesive in a way, like in a stronger way, or that there was like more of a, more of like a, a through line running through a lot of these songs. Yeah. Um, is that the the tarot and the medieval themes you were talking about? More just the medieval themes. Um, I mean, the tarot themes are kind of in there, but with a lot of things, you kind of figure it out after the fact. Um, like you have a bunch of music that you make and you're like, how can I tell a narrative story with this in some sort of way? Um, and like, what does this song sound like in that narrative? Right. Uh, so kind of trying to create like a sonic narrative where it goes from, it kind of is a bit brighter and then it gets darker as it goes on. Um, or more melancholic, I guess. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, this one's more thoughtful than the other things I've done. I had an EP called Nightfall. Right, which I was uh, I was about to bring that up because that EP, at least from my understanding, that seems very thoughtful in the sense that my understanding is that it's sort of a, a narrative about your insomnia at the time. It was kind of that, but it was also a narrative about, it was a story that was kind of connecting to Dawn. Uh, it's kind of like a cliffhanger type thing right. to Dawn. Uh, Cause it's not the first track on the album, but I released that song with Rio Craig and uh, that, the final track on Nightfall, very, it's very quiet, but it mixes into uh, the song with Rio. Ooh, that's great. Um, just because it's, uh, at the time, that was going to be the intro to the album, but then it wasn't, but it still worked out because it was still the first thing I released. Right. Like, that wasn't a remix after uh, Nightfall. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, that was more of a narrative about a guy that's going on a drive at night to this kind of like abandoned town uh, to find something. And the names are kind of based on things that happen to that. Uh, and God raises is just what you see when the sun's rising. Right. And then right after you see, because uh, the God rays happen before you see the sun usually. It's like the first thing you see is the light come over and then you see the sun. So right after the God raises dawn. Um, and the medieval thing does connect to that in a way. Uh, but I kind of want to figure out how to do that visually without like explaining the whole thing. Uh, yeah. Like by word. But various medieval things, just because, oh, well, actually... The medieval idea came from a dream. Oh, uh, interesting. I had a dream. I was listening to my music on Spotify and it had a medieval artwork. I'm like, I'm going to do that. <laughs> oh, man. I'm going to do that. <laughs> You're collaborating with yourself again, man. I love that. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I don't know. Um, yeah, I guess it's collaborating with the universe. I don't know. Yeah, for sure. Um, no, it's just like letting go kind of of all of the control of music and letting some things kind of make themselves in a way. Um, 
I don't know. So this one's kind of more based around a direct narrative, this album, more than kind of a theme. Although the narrative is based around a theme, but the it's more structurally fleshed out than just kind of a vibe. Yeah. There's like specific things that uh, the album's about, like a story. Right. It, like it follows a whole story that I thought of after making the album. Well, and what's interesting, and I'll, I'll say this because I, I have heard this now, and sorry to everybody who hasn't heard it yet, but, you know, listening, <laughs> listening through it, it, it's interesting because I think that now that you say that, I can, I can kind of imagine that narrative and that, you know, the, the flow right. of it. But at the same time, I think it's interesting because somebody could listen to that whole album without knowing that and also yeah. enjoy it. Like it, to me, there's yeah. multiple levels people could engage on, you know? Well, and it's such a long album that my thinking is kind of like, there will be a handful of people who will listen to the full thing all the way through in order. And that's hopefully a cool experience for them. Uh, but some people may just find a few tracks on it they like and make kind of their own story out of it or their own narrative out of it, kind of, or their right. own album in kind of a non pretentious way. I was just, I just want to put a bunch of music out so people can find stuff they like out of it. And maybe one person will like a certain group of tracks, one person will like a, certain, a different group of tracks, but there'll kind of be something that everybody can like on it. Yeah. Well, I love that. I mean, certainly with, with that many tracks, I think you got a, a good shot at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You might be able to find like 10 or nine or something. That's like a standard album length. Yeah. And those are the tracks you like. It's, it's but, interesting too. Can we, am I allowed to talk about the, the record label you're working with that that's public, right? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Cause yeah, you yeah. already released singles and, and whatever. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting to me that you're working with, with ultra for this too. I thought that was a, a very interesting choice for the music that you make and right. you know, kind of like what they're known for. Yeah. They'd be known for more standard, uh, electronic music stuff. Although they have released some stuff. I think you pronounce his name Mark Waugh. Uh, it's like M A R C I O Z. I think it is. So oh, I've seen I've seen that name. Yeah, yeah. He's really strange as far as the music he makes, and he's also on Ultra. He's done stuff with Ultra, so they have done stuff that's kind of a bit out there. But I guess who they used to work with, like Dead Mouse and. Well, I mean, they would get in those kind of all, Yeah, for sure. I mean, Ultra like is like early, of, early electronic music kind of. Well, yeah, for like EDM stuff. For I mean, EDM stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ultra is a legendary label. But yeah, I think they're, you know, back in the day in the 90s and all that, you know, they were they were working with, uh, yeah, the people you named, the Gettas, the Dead Mouses of the world, a yeah. lot of like really big EDM artists kind of had their debut on ultra, but they, you're absolutely right. They put out all kinds of music. I like ultra a lot, you know, yeah. shout out to ultra. I just, it's interesting to me, like who ends up where at what time, like so much of it is, is timing, right? Yeah. A lot of it's timing and, um, just also just who offers like, uh, good deals also as far as that goes. Like well, that sure, that... Business side of it. Yeah, oh, absolutely, which is extreme. You know, I think a lot of our conversation today has been the the philosophical, the creative, <laughs> artistic side. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we got to pay our rent with this, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I there's this thing where I'll, I'll get... I don't know. I don't know what I can really say, but it's kind of like I'll be paid after I submit my album. That's... That, that's that's when I get the money I get. Um, and technically, because I'm mixing and mastering stuff, I haven't submitted my album. Mm. Uh, like, actually, like, it's done, done. Right. So, as far as paying, paying the bills, paying the rent, <laughs> that hasn't happened. Yet. Well, sure, but that's, I mean, man, you're, you're not alone by a long shot with that. I mean, that's yeah, like, yeah. that's in any creative vocation, the, the payday is always like just over the horizon. 
And, yeah. and the people who make it in this business, man, in this game, it's the people who don't quit. Cause I think like that, I think there's going to be so many people watching this now or listening later who relate to that, where it's just like, man, it's rough right now, but you know, I see what this could be. I see it on the horizon. One thing is if you ever look at like a music artist and you're like, oh, they must make so much money. Sometimes it's true, but a lot of times it's not true. Nope, not true. <laughs> even at even at a like a pretty high level, it's still oh, people are constantly surprised. Yeah, man, you cannot just because you see somebody posting festival videos on Instagram every weekend. Of All them, I'll say is recently, yeah. I had an overdraft fee in my bank <laughs> from a ten dollar <laughs> plug-in subscription. <laughs> so yeah, it's yeah. definitely not. People who make music don't do it for money most of the time. You don't You don't seem stressed out, though. You don't seem super anxious. I, I might just be reading it wrong, but... I mean, I have bad uh, anxiety and, like, uh, OCD. But as far as, li like, money goes, I, I don't worry too much because I, I live with my uh, family. Right. So I don't have to worry about, like if I'm going to be evicted or something, uh, which is lucky. Um, oh, absolutely. But it's, that's great, man. I mean, this is another thing that I don't think a lot of people know is like how many producers and DJs are in that situation and still, you know, like people you'd think yeah. are, are like super famous DJs. It's like, no, nah, man, I know. Yeah. Home. Yeah. I mean, if I can eat cereal or like some sort of food or like ramen or something, <laughs> some sort of food. I'm, yeah. I'm fine. Yeah. Uh, I don't need to have that much money. And usually whenever I get money, I just want to like put it back into music, like getting something for music or something creative. That's smart. That's um, smart, man. I've thought about, I've thought about the idea like, well, if I'm getting money uh, from the music I make, I could eventually save up enough to do something else, like make a film or something. Uh, Cause I really like film. I've thought about, I'm, this is a really random thing, but I've thought about like horror movies recently. Okay. And I'm think I'm trying to think there hasn't really been a horror movie where I've genuinely been like scared, like really scared. And maybe I'm just getting older or something. I'm not scared by movies anymore. <laughs> I don't know. But I really want to make a movie that's like when you watch it, you're genuinely creeped out and there's like not no jump scares in it. Right. It's just genuinely terrifying and doing things with audio in the film that would make it even more scary. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, that's just a ra ra really random thought. No, I love just, that though, man. Cause that's uh, the, the way you're talking about creativity in general. It, it's, I like it because it's less about, like, here's the plan. Here's how I envision it. It's more kind of just in the, that immediate in the moment thing we've been talking about this whole time of just the idea comes to you, you, you execute it, you move yeah. on and you, and you keep it moving, which yeah, I think, next. <laughs> well, right, exactly. Yeah. And, and don't worry so much about the outcomes of it, which I think right. is yeah, for, yeah. for a creative, I think that's like a very healthy place to be. Yeah. Uh, if I liked what I made, then I th I think it's usually good. I don't really uh, worry too much about like if if I release a song and one person likes it, that's that's cool. It's a song they can listen to a bunch and that they'll enjoy, and it's another song for them to listen to in their Spotify playlist. Yeah. But yeah, I try to kind of separate the success side of it and the the, I don't know, just getting reassurance from the, the sheer like numbers support that you're getting on it versus yeah. it's kind of, it kind of ends when I make it as far as my connection to worrying about what happens with it. Well, there's, um, I, I say this quote uh, these days, almost every time I do one of these podcasts is one of my favorite quotes, which is uh, great art is never finished. It's only abandoned, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, that's definitely how I feel with a lot of the things I've mixed and mastered myself. Uh, 
which is everything but I didn't mix and master my last single, Wayne For You. I didn't mix and master the What's Not remix I did. Okay. I didn't do Thimble. I didn't do... Uh, uh, I did a remix of a, a Manu Dia song with Panama. I, I did mix that. They did extra mastering for it, though. And I didn't mix and master uh, a song I did called Petrichor with Tech Genesis. Uh, but all the other ones I've done, and those ones, yeah, I kind of just, there's a point where I have to give up. And I'm like, this isn't really what I wanted it to sound like, but I'm running out of time to work on it. Like, I can't keep working on it. Do you think for the ones you didn't mix and master, how is that experience? Is that something you'd be open to doing more of in the future? Because I know plenty of incredible musicians who, for, for whatever reason, that part of it just isn't isn't their their happy place. No, it's not my happy place either as far as that goes. Like mixing and mastering is not something I like. But I'm very particular with how I want things to like hit and sound in a song. Yeah. That... I almost kind of have to do it myself uh, because the back and forth with somebody else that would mix and master it takes so many times back and forth that one, it, it usually costs a lot of money yeah, because mixing and mastering isn't cheap. And two, sometimes you just, it doesn't even get to where you want it to be with mix and mastering when it's someone else. And in those cases, like, Sometimes I've just kind of been like, well, maybe the way I heard it wasn't how it has to sound. Uh, right. And it can sound different. And then I'll, I'll come to like it eventually as far as uh, how it's mixed. That's also happened with things I've mixed myself. I've finished it. I'm like, I don't like this. Right. And then I've not listened to it for like a week. And then I come back. I'm like, oh, this doesn't sound it. This actually sounds pretty good. That happened with the song I did with uh, Rio Cragen. I mixed and mastered that one. It took forever. And then I, I think it was like, I think I missed deadline to submit it, to release it on time. Right. And then something was moved around in the scheduling where later on it was like, we can still release the same date, but you have, I think it was like 48 hours to do it. I'm like, <laughs> Oh no. I'm like, I've, I've already spent like four or five months trying to mix this thing. How am I going to do it in 48 hours? Um, so I stayed up for 48 hours, not sleeping. <laughs> I think I had two cups of coffee. Didn't have that much caffeine, but it's not that much, not that much caffeine, but I was somehow awake. Maybe it was just the stress of, I have to finish the song that kept me awake. Yeah. Um, and I mixed it and then I'm like, I don't like how this sounds. Oh, and it was like never ending car tests. Like I made this mix of it i'm gonna go in the car and see, hear how it sounds. <laughs> you're just going back and um, forth yeah and then at the very end i'm like i'm out of time i gotta submit it and i'm like here it is i'm really not that happy with how this sounds this is i i hate making music i hate everything about music <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like but here it is and then i woke up the next morning i'm like no, it actually doesn't sound that bad. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds fine. Um, and then the longer I was away from it, I'm like, oh, it sounds fine. It's actually the mixing on it is something I sometimes reference Yeah, for things I make now. Sometimes you need the external deadline, man. Sometimes you need somebody to step yeah. up and just be like, no, at this time it will be done. Yeah. Well, mixing mastering is difficult because your ears can sometimes just after a while, oh, start yeah. deceiving you where you're not hearing it the same way you would normally hear it. And yeah, that's the most difficult thing, the technical side. But yeah. I still don't really feel like I know how to mix and master. It's like every time I try to mix and master a new song, I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I did last time. I feel like I forgot how to do it. Right. <laughs> and I try to like figure out what did I do last time? How did I do this? I don't know. I should have, I should have like saved a video of me doing it or something. So I remembered how to do it. So I don't know. I still feel like every time, even with just making a song, not even mixing mastering, 
I don't know what I'm doing every time I start a new song. I think that's good. Honestly, it might not feel comfortable, but I think that's good. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I like I've talked to so many people, man, and and uh, yeah, we we don't have to go too far down this rabbit hole. I, I want to. I know we have a whole bunch of questions from people too that I want to oh, okay. get to real soon. But but I do want to say, you know, I've I've talked to plenty of people on this podcast who have been doing this for decades, had incredible careers, all of that. Nobody knows what they're doing. Nobody, no, yeah, you know, nobody knows what they're doing. even the people we look at as geniuses and the people who always, you know, everything they put out, it's like, oh, this is so incredible. They don't know what they're doing either. Yeah, yeah, that is something I've realized. <laughs> But I feel like the best, the best art is made by people who constantly feel like they're learning when they're making something uh, and never feel comfortable with where they're at. They're always like, I've done this, now i got to move on to something else because if I keep doing this, it's going to get stale. Yeah. Just always kind of being on edge about what, what you're making and trying to change it up is, I think, a good thing, even though it can be stressful as far as what am I going to make next? Right. But that, what makes, am I gonna do? that makes me think of what you said when, when you were a kid, just figuring out this stuff, you know, comparing it to gaming versus, you know, making music is that when you were making music, you were always learning. You always walked away with something, some new yeah. technique or some new progress thing. I mean, I think that we're talking about the same thing here. Like that, that to me True. seems like a, a through line in this whole conversation. But uh, yeah, man, I'd love to, uh, we, we've got a bunch of people in the chat here and a, a bunch of people who have been asking questions. If you're down for it, I'd love to throw a couple of these at you. Uh, yeah. Uh, what are they? Uh, yeah. All right. Let's see what they are. I'm looking <laughs> right now. Um, okay. So the first question is great because this is actually something I wanted to talk about as well. Uh, what the first question says is how do you meet up with Flume? But I want to, I want to expand that a little bit. And, and I wanted to ask you, what is the deal with you and Australians? There is, you've, you've like connected with <laughs> and worked with all these Australian, uh, artists and producers, but what, what, how did that happen? What is that connection? It was just like people I met on SoundCloud and then met people that they knew and then met people that those people knew and just started meeting a bunch of Australian people. And then because of knowing all those people, I kind of became part of the, a small like Australian beat community, which kind of made me more known in Australia than even the United States possibly. Oh, so you were maybe um, a little bigger in Australia before here. No, I, well, I mean, there's definitely people that are at like EDM events or shows that my music would be played there more often than here. Like, for instance, my music's been played on uh, Triple J a few times, which is like a Australian radio station. Yeah, like big, a, a government station, funded. Yeah, um, and not not that I know of has it been played on an American radio station. So. Definitely, I think Australia is more of a, a homeland for my music than the <laughs> United States. Um, I just somehow met a lot of Australian people through SoundCloud, I guess. And then, I don't know. I, I remember uh, there's a person named Howells. It's H L or H-W-L-S, uh, who found my music on SoundCloud. And he's, he was a big supporter of my music. I think he still is. Um, and he, I don't know if he's from Australia, but he lives in Australia, I think. Um, and I believe he was the person who showed my music to Rio Cragen, uh, who had just worked with Flu. Uh, and I don't, know how flume found my music to this day hmm. um i've never asked um but i had worked with rio quite a bit so it could have been because of that i don't know um but yeah i just got a random message from flume on instagram one day and i happened to be in la so we met up uh that day or no a few days after but we're like 
we're both going to be in LA so we can meet up. And then met up with him like two months after that. But then what? Then COVID hit. Yeah. Uh, and we obviously can't travel around, but we still worked on stuff like over just the internet. So yeah, I don't know. That's how I met him. I think uh, What's So Not found my music on SoundCloud. Um, I love that just, remix you did for him. That's, that's yeah, that was like remix. right after or pretty close after. Or no, it wasn't. It was like a year after. My, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's my, not, dude. My brain doesn't work, but same. He found my music and then was doing a show, like I think the next year. Uh, and before I was doing the show, I was working on that remix because he was like, if you want to do this remix, I could have something cool to play out live. Um, and then, uh, worked on that. And then when I met him in person to do the show, uh, we kind of both worked on the remix. So it was kind of, it was like a remix I did, but also he did some stuff on it. Right. Um, there was like an instrument called a, a Dil Ruba, I think it's called. Where he's like, let's add this to the end of it. I'm like, all right. I'm like, it's kind of weird. It's like a, I'm like, I don't know what's going on. It's like a collab with what's not, but it's also a remix of one of his songs. I'm like, this is kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't really know how anything happens in <laughs> music. I just, happens, yeah. I just try to go along. With it. <laughs> I'm just excited when I meet new people. I don't know. Yeah, well, I think the the support of you know some of those people you just named is is probably how a lot more people became aware of your music too. Yeah, it, it's yeah. just an interesting connection, I think, because they all happen to be Australian, and yeah, I, I don't know. I would if say, that might not mean anything, but it's just interesting. I would say what's not is probably uh, the biggest force in like my success i would say as far as a big artist helping out yeah with what i'm doing like he was very uh he's been very helpful he's great man as, he's as he's far the as best. that goes I, I, I love him and i'm i'm grateful for uh I, him liking my music i don't know 100 yeah, percent <laughs> wild yeah is it weird to you know to talk to flume work on stuff with flume when i i assume he was somebody you were listening to early on yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's a weird kind of fever dream working with all <laughs> these people. Uh, even what's not, because I remember listening to, uh, like divide and conquer and, uh, and so, I mean, I was, when all this stuff came out, I was young. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like really uh, young, right? Uh, really young. Yeah. I'm, I'm just turned 20 in July like early July. Yeah. Um, you're still so, really yeah, young. It's crazy. I was really young when a lot of that came out, like divide and conquer the inner bloom remix by what's not is one that I really like. I would, I would put that up there as probably one of the best EDM tracks or best electronic tracks of all time. I would say that that's what's a not inner bloom remix. strong statement, but I, I think there's definitely an argument for it. I think that's one of the, ones. I really like that remix. Oh, I love um, it. I love it. I think it changed, uh, the, you know, it changed, like it made a big impact. It changed the yeah, course yeah. of how some people were thinking about what they were doing. But then, yeah, all the flume stuff is also, yeah, it's just weird working with all these people. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. That's that's fine, man. You don't have to know. It's it's fun too, right? Know. Like as, as long as I it's fun. I don't really understand it <laughs> still, but I don't know. I guess they like my music. Yeah, uh, I, I'm pretty sure they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, speaking of your music, this is a question uh, that it, actually a few different people asked. They're asking, uh, would you ever break down any of your tracks? Do any kind of like production videos where you're going into your sessions talking how about how made. you made them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I work in FL, so a lot of my songs end up getting corrupted. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, a great answer. But for the ones that haven't been corrupted, uh, maybe, I don't know. Um, it's usually just a lot of 808s and 
drum samples. So. <laughs> I like that you're like, guys, it's not that interesting. <laughs> it's just eight oh eight drum samples and like placing everything off grid and then using silent. <laughs> Period. Uh, I love that. Uh, you're uh, like you're like, you don't need to watch the stream. I'll explain it right now. <laughs> uh just place everything, think of the grid kind of as a general guideline, but not you don't really have to follow it. Yeah. If something loops back around at the end, it's going to make a rhythm in some way. It doesn't have to be on beat the whole time if it's going to loop back and play again. Yeah, true. Absolutely. And yeah, that's right. As long as part of it is quantized, you know, the rest well, will like, follow, right? Yeah. If Think of like you have this amount of time to make something and at the end of it, it's going to cut it off and play again. And the repetition of hearing it over and over again will create a rhythm, even if it's not on beat. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, man. I, I completely agree. I think that's that's such a product. Like, even if you take sort of the micro of that idea of just like just moving stuff just a little bit, where you can't, right? Yeah, yeah. Where it doesn't even sound like it's off the grid. You know what I mean? Right. But like, yeah. just those little subtle things can totally change. I have so worth it. Uh, yeah, yeah, can totally Snare change the, how a song sounds, how it makes you feel. It's crazy right. how those tiny I know. noises. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you, okay. So this is from, this is from Amanda, uh, who says, uh, how do you discipline yourself with beat making and practice? Do you have a work schedule you stick to, or is it more, more open when the moment hits? No, I don't, I don't really have a schedule. I just make music a lot because I like making music. So I come back to it a lot. I think it's important not to beat yourself up if you're not if you're thinking you're not making progress because there's times where you may not make that much progress, but there's other times where something will click and you'll be a lot more productive and fast at making something. But I think the more you stress about, you know, I feel like I should be making more. I feel like I should be like more productive, uh, stresses you out more and makes you just not level headed when you're trying to make something. So just kind of make things when you want to make things because that's probably when you'll have something cool to make is when you actually want to do it versus like trying to make something that's not working out and you're getting frustrated. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can never, you, you, you can't put inspiration or creativity on a, on a timer, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, we've been talking I mean, about this the whole time. It, it's just those moments when it hits you, it hits you and we're not always, in control of that, which, which actually brings me to another question that, uh, this is from, from Toha in Las Vegas, shout out to Las Vegas, uh, asking about what kind of, uh, non-musical things inspire you. Cause I think if we're talking about sometimes you're not inspired to make music, you do it when you want to do it. You know, sometimes I think you got to step away and you got to let yeah. life and the world, you know, do something to your brain in the background before you can come back to it. I don't know. I guess random things. A general thing that is kind of inspiring to me is um, just colors in general, just color schemes or just looking at like a piece of art, visual art that has a cool color scheme. Even if it's not like, it doesn't really matter what the content of it is. If it's something that's just visually stimulating, I guess, like just cool colors and something that's like, that's cool looking. And I can kind of imagine what that would sound like almost. Do you have synesthesia? No, I don't think so. Okay. Cause that's just, I, I have that a little bit. Like I hear music and oh, I, right. I like see colors when certain music is right. playing. No, I don't really get that, but I can imagine like, what if I tried to make what that thing sounded like? Mm. Like, look at something and then you're like, what would this sonically sound like if you try to make it into a song? And then doing that. Or uh, something that Flume mentioned was, he's like, just try to do something different rhythmically. Like, don't always, you don't always have to do trap. Take a rhythm from another genre and bring it into what you do, but kind of continue what you're doing uh, melodically. So like just make a song, but it's in like 
like a South American rhythm or something, but the sonics are still the weird glitchy stuff that you do. Yeah. So that that's a good piece of advice, I would say, as far as being inspired. But also just random things. Like I really like um uh just there there was a whole time where I went on a like spree of watching stuff about mushrooms. Okay. Like just mushrooms and general, not like the psychedelic ones, yeah, but yeah. just mushrooms and how they can do all these complex things about making like essentially like wiring systems, like the way they connect to each other and how I think it was like they, they remade, it was like they remade the New York subway system or something, but more efficiently than it was built. Just the, the fungi or fungi, whatever it is, yeah. created this system that was more efficient to move through than what humans design mm. and just random things mushrooms can do and all the health benefits some mushrooms have like lion's mane mushrooms have a good effect on uh i think delaying uh dementia i think it is or alzheimer's right uh and help with uh anxiety i think that's a random thing but just just reading about like some random thing, you're like, oh, this is cool. And then I feel like the best thing to do to be inspired is to just do random things that may not seem productive as far as like just learning about things. And then you'll kind of be in a learning mindset after you've learned all these things. Mm -hmm. And music might be more enticing to make after you've kind of gone in that mindset because you're like, what can I learn from making music rather than I got to make a track. I got to try and create something. It's like, what can I learn from making music? Ooh, that's a, or, yeah, that's a big one. Or scents. That's the other thing. Just smells. Because smells are the strongest thing tied to memory. Strongest sense tied to memory. So if you smell something that's, you haven't smelled in a while or is different, it will put you in a, I feel like it puts you in a different headspace than where you currently were. Well, and smells, That's why smells can... Walking helps, I think. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Walking's huge, too. Smells, yeah. much like music, at least for me, can immediately snap you back to like right. a memory or a moment in your past, yeah, yeah. too, which, is, which I think is a, a perfect I think analogy. having the right smells in your environment is really important. If you have a, a good smelling environment, like I have a, I have a humidifier with tea tree oil in it, which is, by the way, Australian. Um, <laughs> there it is again. <laughs> and that smell, it's just a nice smell. And it, it, I feel like your environment is definitely uh, a big factor in what you make, like where you are when you make it, you, just physically, mentally also, but physically as well. Mm. So have a good environment because there's been a lot of times where I've, my desk just has a bunch of trash on it and like <laughs> McDonald's wrappers <laughs> or like a bag of Takis or something. Um, and if you have a better clean environment, that's nice visually. I feel like it's better to have that. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, it's, I, it makes I, I think about this too. And, and this, this will tie in to uh, Michael from Colorado asking, uh, just any thoughts or memories you have about your song Firecracker. And uh, if you can remember, I I'm curious what environment that was written in and, and what was going on, you know, around you at the time. I don't know. I think I was really sad when I wrote that. I don't know why. <laughs> I mean, do we ever know, you know? <laughs> I think I was, for some reason, really sad when I wrote that. And I honestly don't remember I feel like I should remember, but I really don't. But I mean, it was the same room I've made everything else in. I don't know what headspace I was in for that. I think I was just sad for some reason, but I can't remember why. Yeah. I mean, we don't always know <laughs> why, man. And it's, yeah. I think I knew why, but I don't know. <laughs> At the time. Yeah. I, I understand. At the time. Yeah. So Pinecone is asking, um, as long as we're talking about genre, uh, inspiration, uh, are there any new sounds, any new music, uh, whether it's a, a genre or a style or an artist that's inspiring you right now? Right now? 
Uh, right now, the most inspiring stuff I'm hearing is an artist named Bickle. Uh, an artist named Bickle, and I've been going back and listening to a bunch of Alex G. He's like an indie artist. Um, so indie stuff. Which is, um, I, I feel like I was going to use that word indie when we were talking about uh, Waiting For You, the the new single. Oh too. yeah, that, that was kind of more, that one was more directly inspired by like, uh, there's an artist named Benny in from New Zealand. Um, whose music I was really liking at the time. Uh, this was, because that song was much older than when it released. Sure. Um, and yeah, I was like, what if I made like a indie pop Benny song mixed with electronic music, whatever. Um, and then, yeah, I, I would just say indie stuff. But like recently, a lot of, sad indie music i've been like like dark sad melancholic indie music more than like indie pop kind of stuff, right. or bedroom pop type stuff um well you're out in portland right i feel like sad indie music and portland is like a match made in heaven <laughs> yeah probably probably um and then i recently i've gone back and listened to a bunch of uh boards of canada oh boards of canada is amazing yeah um, so that kind of stuff, I don't know. I don't know what the hell kind of music I'm listening to. Do you think what you listen to affects the kind of music you're writing at the time? Yeah, I, I would say, yeah, definitely does. Maybe subconsciously, but maybe not subconsciously also. also. Like, um, if there's something I like the sound of and I listen to it, I'm like, this is really cool sounding. I'll be like, how can I mix that with what I do currently? Uh, so as far as the indie stuff goes, I do kind of want to find a way to mix like sad indie music with electronic music, but in a way that's, that makes sense. That isn't like, there's a guitar playing, there's a bill up that drops into this like thing <laughs> where it's actually like, it's part of the songwriting of the indie song. So yeah, it definitely, yeah. yeah. What I listen to affects what I made, I would say. Which, yeah, that, that makes sense. But yeah, that's, but it's interesting to hear. It still carries over from what I've done, kind of. Like, what I've done still carries over into what I make because it's, it's the skill I've built up the most is what I know how to make. So there's always going to be kind of the clipping drums, wonky sound uh, in there because that's just kind of how I know how to make music. Yeah, which I, I think it's good to have, I mean, not only techniques that you rely on, things that can simplify your workflow, but that's, you know, sonically, that's like an identity too, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is actually the another question that somebody asked. You're like just opening up all these questions. It's great. Uh, <laughs> Lucas, who's listening from the, or watching from the Czech Republic, uh, was, oh. was asking about your, your drums and saying, drums. uh, you know, basically how do you make your drums sound the way they do? He says he finds them special and unique. I mean, he's asking technically about, do you layer samples? Do you have some special technique? Uh, yeah. And I, no, I it's think it's a the, good question. It's just depends on the sample that you find. And then using a soft clipper to just, make it really loud and then clip it a bunch. It's pretty much, that's how the drums are done. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Cave Clip's a good uh, soft clip plugin if you want a specific plug Cave Clip. Hey, that's good. Yeah. So, sometimes I think people do listen to these and just are like, no, tell me the specific, tell me exactly what to do. Yeah. I feel like that's the, the same reason everyone watches tutorials too. It's oh, just like, another thing, layer a hi-hat with the kick if you want to sound a bit uh, better and then clip it with the kick and the hi-hat together. There you in go. In a soft clipper. I like that. That's that's a specific thing you can do. Yeah, I, I think it's it's funny, man, because I think so often, and I don't know if you were ever like this. You said you didn't watch a lot of tutorials coming up, but not too many. When I was young too, and, and just learning how to make music, you know, I, it's natural. You're just like, well, no, just tell me how to do it. Just like I, I want to <laughs> know the secret. But then really the answer is always that there is no secret, right? And that it, we're all kind of figuring it out as we go yeah i would say 
for the specific questions like that, where it's like, how do you get the drums to sound that certain way? Uh, it is helpful to know kind of the, the process. So it's mainly just, uh, sample selection and clipping things bunch with a soft clipper. I didn't know until way later on that I should have been using a soft clipper because I was just clipping the master, which <laughs> didn't always work. Cause right. I was like, well, this one, this it's, why does it not sound good when I clip this song, but sound good when I did the other one? It's like, if you're clipping it with a certain, it depends on the, the range of frequencies you have in the song. Uh, so yeah, soft clippers help a lot. Make sure you use a soft clipper if you want to make something sound like it's clipping, but not actually be bad in the mix. Yeah. That's something that I didn't know for a very long time <laughs> until like last year. <laughs> well, we're, we're putting it out there now, a little present for, for all the up and comers uh, listening to this. Um, a bunch of people are asking about more album details. Is, is it, is it coming this year? Can you say that? Do we know that? Um, no, I don't think it's coming. I think it's next year. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Good. But singles, yeah. singles are coming. Yeah. Out. Yeah. Yeah. There there's a lot of tracks on the album. So there's a lot of singles. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a lot yeah. of tracks on that album, man. I, I love that you did that. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, I mean a lot of tracks. this is this is maybe a good place to ask you, you know, is, is there anything as we're kind of wrapping it up here? Is there anything else we haven't talked about anything coming up other than the new single coming out next Friday? Anything else that's on your mind? Anything else you want to let people know about? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I really don't know. I I feel like I haven't heard a an EDM song in a while that's been like that's blown me away. That's been like, how do they do that? Right. So I just want to hear more stuff that's like I guess that's kind of what I try to make. I try to make something where if I didn't make it, somebody would be like, How how did they do that? Mm. Um for like producers, not even just like a general listener, like a producer listens to it and they're like what did they do? <laughs> right. That's the kind of stuff I, I try to make. Um, so I don't know. I just wish maybe I should just go on Spotify a bunch or something. Maybe I haven't heard enough music, <laughs> but I just want to hear more stuff. That's like, I don't know how they did it. And I haven't heard that much recently. Well, Although I feel like, yeah, not, not that much music's, uh, at least early this year, kind of not that much has come out. I think it's starting to roll, roll up now and more people are starting to release, but there's a big period where I feel like I wasn't seeing much. Some people were holding back for sure that that's absolute. Yeah, yeah. But then at the same time, there's so much music coming out every day. You know, that's it's, true. it's like way yeah. more than ever. I think I just need to go on Spotify or SoundCloud or something. Oh, you know what? On the same day I'm releasing a track, uh, an artist named Heresy, who's a good friend of mine, is releasing a track, which is a really cool track. So I'd say check that out too, because that is something that is in that vein of stuff that I'm impressed by recently. Yeah. Um, and another artist, there's a, a smaller artist from Australia named Tim Zen, uh, who's doing crazy stuff. I really like everything he's doing. So I would say check out his stuff too. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That's great. No, that was like, (laughs) some people just say, nope, I'm good. And no, you gave us like five things, man. That was great. (laughs) I want to hear people making and releasing uh, crazy music. So try anybody listening, try to make something crazy and then send it to me. (laughs) Yeah, please, please. I mean, we started off this conversation more or less talking about the same idea that, you know, it's so easy to get stagnant with this and it's so easy to just make something that, just to try to get in with the scene or the sound or just to be a part of it. And I I think the argument we're making here is like, you really got to examine your motivations. Like why, why do we do this? What do we actually like? What are we actually excited by? And, and, you know, right. Yeah. How can we, how can we push it forward? Like if we're not pushing it forward, what's the point? Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know. I guess that's the message of this of today. <laughs> I, I think so too, man. I mean, I, there's a few messages, you know, the the new album and looking out for the new music is absolutely part of the message. But uh, man, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you one final question. It's the question I ask at the end of each one of these uh, okay. episodes. Uh, just looking for a time in your life, a moment, a memory, could be from any time, when in that moment, music really deeply affected you, really had a deep impact on you in the moment. And it doesn't have to be significant. It's kind of just no wrong answer, whatever you think of first. Hmm. When I first listened to just the mental space I was in wasn't great. Uh, and I, it was just a time where I was just not doing that great. When I first listened to uh, the song Unmade by Tom York oh, from yeah. the Suspirium soundtrack, or Suspiria soundtrack, it's called Suspirium the soundtrack. Um, that song, I don't know what it was, but just the sound of it. And I guess what he was saying was probably when it's affected me the most, I'm like, it was also like, this is just him singing over piano. You don't have to do, you don't have to do a thousand elements to make something that sounds new and fresh. You just have to use it in a way that's cool and unique mm. and, and updated. So it was just that it was just listening to that and being like one Something about the songs, I'm going through it right now. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but two, it's like he's just using two elements pretty much. I mean, there's like ambience in it, but pretty much just two elements and doing so much with it. So that's what, when I was kind of like, maybe I don't have to throw a bunch of crap into a song to make something cool. You just focus on making the small amount of things that you have as good as possible and as unique as possible. I think that's such a, such a great note. I talk about this all the time where, you know, if, if you're in the middle of working on something and you don't know what it needs or, or you're not quite there yet, of course, the first instinct is like, oh, well, what if I throw some chords on top of it? Or what if I throw in this crazy yeah. fill? But the answer is always, what can I take away from this? What can I take yeah, out right. of this? Or what can you make better that's already there? Right. Like, how can you make, how can you take like an 808, but put so many weird effects on it that it sounds like a new 808 or <laughs> something that I want 808s to sound like that from now on or that kind of thing. Yeah. I don't know. Just making sure everything in the song has a place and is doing the best it can to, to make a unique song. Mm. I love it, man. I, I I love this whole conversation. I really, I wasn't sure exactly what we were going to talk about, but I feel like we hit oh. a couple themes like really strongly. I really enjoyed this. Oh, thank you. No, yeah, it was, thank you. It was a interesting conversation. I see that cat's laying down in the background too. Oh yeah. You know, he's been there the whole time, which is rare. Usually about halfway through, he gets up and yells at me. It's a good sign, I guess. I <laughs> yeah, no, he's he's chilling. <laughs> uh, yeah, man, that, that's it. We don't got to draw this out. I appreciate you doing All it. Right. I, I hope you had a good time. And uh, yeah, I'd love, I did, to, yeah. love to come back and do it again sometime. Yeah, thank you for having me on. Hopefully I didn't like ramble on about random stuff too much and talk too much about just one thing. It's stuck on it. Uh, oh, no, that's literally impossible. That's like the point of this show is doing that. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I just hope I didn't like start talking so much that it didn't make sense. Oh, oh no, it, it was great, man. I really, really, truly enjoyed it. And uh, oh, thank yeah, you. I, I think everybody watching this and everybody who's going to listen to this later feels the same way, man. This was this was fantastic. I appreciate it. And uh, it's great to meet thank you, you for man. Talking. Hope, oh, dude, thank you. And have a great rest of your day, man. I'm excited to too. Uh, excited for the next time we cross paths. Well, if you're ever down here, there's a lot of coffee places. You'll probably get a coffee. <laughs> hey, that sounds like a plan. <laughs> have a great rest of your day. It's been great talking to you. You too. Thank you for talking. Thank you so much. Talk. Take care. Take care. Peace.